Today, every business is a digital business. Most of us are migrating workloads to the cloud, adopting DevOps tools, rolling out RPA software, and supporting a remote workforce. While opportunity is great, so is the risk of advanced cyber attacks. Many high-profile breaches start with a compromise of privileged credentials. CyberArk is the number one leader in privileged access management. Talk to CyberArk today to secure privileged access for humans and machines across hybrid and cloud environments and on endpoints. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash CyberArk and stay one step ahead of the attackers. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from zero to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Join the Security Weekly mailing list and receive your invite to our community Discord server by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, clicking the join button. Uh, join the discussion on Discord. It's been great. All of our shows are now being broadcast live, and there is a, a chat associated with each of them and our webcast, too. So it's been a lot of fun. Heather Adkins is an 18-year Google veteran and founding member of the Google security team. As the Senior Director of Information Security, she has built a global team responsible for maintaining the safety and security of Google's networks, systems, and applications. I would not want that level of responsibility, Heather, to be honest with you. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, some mornings I wake up and I wonder what I'm doing. But um, yeah, that's but yeah. It's, been a, it's been a great ride. Yeah, yeah you have a lot uh, on your plate, certainly. Uh, yeah. And uh, a new book uh, on uh, site reliability engineering. I guess we'll start with what, what is site reliability engineering? So site reliability engineering is Google's approach to managing systems. If you look at a traditional enterprise, at least as I was coming into the industry, what we had were developers and systems administrators. And there mm. was this very clear handoff between who wrote the code and who started jobs on a system. Mm -hmm. We took a different approach at Google for scale. And because we learned that we, we really needed the people running the systems to also be developers. So think of site reliability engineers as developers who are maintaining and help uh, help scale the system. And the SRE teams at Google have written two books on this. Um, and we have now added a third book that touches on the intersection between reliability and security as fundamental properties of the system. And uh, the book, which you can see behind me, is uh, called Building Secure and Reliable Systems. And it is really focused at the, you know, the developer, the SRE, anybody who's designing implementing, maintaining systems, to think of these properties, security and reliability, as the fundamental core part of the system and not just add-ons that come later. You know, Heather, it's interesting. One one thing I've noticed over the years, you know, having been a systems administrator more than 20 years ago, I have to date myself while well, I'm old, but um, you you could implement systems back in the day, right? You physically racked them and you installed the software on them, right? And you may have had some scripts to help kind of tie some pieces together. Today, when we think about deploying anything, there's a lot more code uh, that's involved. And so my question is, uh, you know, when we talk about your book and uh, kind of explain the way Google is deploying systems, uh, how much of it is deploying someone else's software, commercial or open, and how much of it is deploying your own software? And then how much software is actually associated with deploying someone else's software? Because I think it's a lot more than before. Yeah, I think it's really complicated. And when you also add in the fact that a lot of config now is mm -hmm. treated as code, right. this gets even more complicated. So I think that we're looking at everything, uh, the full range, everything from I've bought an enterprise software package and I'm installing it and running it to I'm running an enterprise software package, but it runs on top of open source, yep. which is a, you know fourth and fifth party code. Mm -hmm. um, to I develop everything um, on the full stack. Um, and the principles apply kind of fairly reasonably to the whole thing, because still somebody is writing that enterprise software that you're running, yeah. even if you're not building it. And so you're just relying on the enterprise uh, 
you know, pr the people who are producing that software to have these um, components in place as well. So it's really the the, the full chain, and it applies to hardware. Um, it applies to the building infrastructure, uh, all the software that's running the building that you're in, all the software that runs the power system that you rely on. Mm -hmm. We need these principles throughout the whole stack. Matt? You, you, we see aspects of this uh, with sustaining engineering from a software development perspective. It sounds like what Google's done is taken this to the entire stack, including the infrastructure. Is that is that a good analogy? Yeah, and I think maybe let's talk a little bit about the premise of the book first. Um, we've really seen developers challenged with this notion of security and reliability. And the reason for that is that it comes typically much later in the life cycle of the system. So you think about the developer, I look at this in, um, especially for open source projects, where you're writing a lot of code and you might do functionality testing to make sure that the, the, you know, the purpose of the code works. I thought that was the but, user's job. <laughs> uh, well, that's what happens, right? right. They, they get it in their hands and then you know they generate bugs around functionality, of course. Um, but then we also see these catastrophic failures that happen later on. Like maybe mm -hmm. the system didn't scale to the to the load that your users put on it, or perhaps you get hacked later. And what we found after studying this for about 20 years is that the patterns that exist during the failures can be anticipated and they can be anticipated by the developer. And so if you're taking a methodical approach to that, you can get ahead of the, the curve uh, fairly early on. But that means that we need developers to be the ones thinking about these problems, uh, not just the people who run the systems that come later on. So we're challenging these roles. Now, this is quite a challenging book, and we've, we have gotten that feedback from our reviewers and some of our readers, that we're challenging these traditional roles that have existed. You know, you're an engineer. Yeah, but I, I, like, I like these challenges, Heather, because I, I think it's something that we've kind of flirted with as a topic in that uh, traditionally there was your network engineer, there was your systems engineer, and there was your developer, right? I mean, just very basic kind of three different roles. A lot of us security folks, quite frankly, have maybe had all three of those roles in our career yeah. and then said, hey, we can do security is like a thing, but we got to know all those things to do security, right? Yeah. And yeah. But what you're saying is that there's a skills. So what I find is developers sometimes don't have the network knowledge, right? And maybe systems people don't have the developer knowledge. But what you're saying is these roles are, are merging, which... I think it's fantastic, quite frankly. Yep, I think these roles are merging. I think the complexity of what you have to know is a really good point. So we focus a lot in the book on the role of the security specialist, because there mm -hmm. is still a role. Right. And that role is to help the developers do things very easy. Mm -hmm. um, think about some of the trends we're seeing now around continuous integration, continuous de uh, deployment. If we can put the, you know, transparently to the developer in a very useful way, we can put security in all of these steps, then they can do security actually by, you know, by accident, um, instead of having to go out and take, you know, four years of classes and learn everything there is to know. And that's really what we're trying to get at. We're trying to get at how do we kind of plug security in very early in a very transparent way for the developer. Yeah, we were just talking about that earlier on the show. In fact, you know, uh, just talking about vulnerabilities that exist in libraries or code that I'm inheriting in my environment and identifying those, testing them, make sure it really is a vulnerability, and then generating a ticket for a developer. How do we get that developer to understand the impact and make the fix without having some knowledge of security? Or do they just need a lesser knowledge of security uh, in some of the scenarios? So that's a very straightforward, um, kind of a very straightforward example. And I think in that case, that's also where security specialists come in mm -hmm. to help validate the fix, right? But I think that if, if we're constantly helping developers test their code, so some examples we might give are um, static analysis checks that happen for buffer overflows at code check-in time, that's an opportunity to educate the developer as mm -hmm. well. When they get a bug filed against them much later in the life cycle, they're going to already have known what a buffer overflow was. Mm -hmm. So just as they learn um, you know, other aspects of programming, buffer overflows are just one type of error. I think the other um, maybe less simple journey that, I, that we're focused on is how do we get the developer out of the, out of the loop? And this is one reason why I'm so excited about what's going on uh, with containerization of microservices is because as we make these applications much more simple, and with cloud computing, 
um, the deployment a little more flexible, you can actually deploy other mitigation strategies in real time if you can detect stuff going wrong. So the fix doesn't always have to be a developer writing some code and checking it in. It can be stopping a virtual machine, redeploying it with a patched version that's already coming from mm -hmm. the open source stream. So this kind of move towards automation and, and move towards automating things also helps the developer have a little more time to fix things at the root cause. Yeah. And and I love those fixes where, you know, something needs to be updated and the developer doesn't have to write any code to fix it, right? Because we can spin it up, test it and say, hey, like when I updated this library, everything works fine. Developer doesn't need to, to like generate a ticket. Like, let's just push out a fix. That's awesome. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, but it's, you know, I think one of the big challenges here is the ephemeral nature of, of containers and in, in these new infrastructures. It requires us to think a little bit differently, though, I think, Heather. In, in some of us that have been in this industry for a long time, and I'm even older than Paul, you know, <laughs> we're used to having our hands on the host or the, the tarball of code. And as that gets abstracted away, we really have to think differently as security people and probably at the software development level as well, to your point, about how do we integrate some of these security checks and balances kind of inside, not from the outside. And, you know, we're still making that that shift as an industry. And I think it's it's tough for some of us that have been around for a long time. I think that's right. I am definitely of a, a, a your generation. Um, I name all my machines. I'm emotionally attached to them. I'm emotionally <laughs> attached to the code that I write. I think that we are, however, moving in this direction. And it is largely what businesses are driving. Uh, they need to do computing more cheaply, more flexibly. Their competition is driving these innovations. So this is this is just going to come. And I said, you know, the book is challenging these notions of roles. It's challenging these notions of technology. And this is going to be a long journey. We're not expecting to publish this book and then, you know, suddenly tomorrow everything changes. This is really the beginning of the conversation. But you're already seeing it. We've been seeing it for the last 10 years as people have moved applications into the cloud, as they've adopted containerization and seen the benefits. We will continue to see these evolutions over the years to come. But computing, the way we look at it now is very different than computing 30 years ago or 40 years ago when we were thinking about single user systems with punch cards. Mm. They would probably have the same reaction to the way we're doing computing today. So what we advise in the book is, you know, keep an open mind, keep the conversations happening, and we're going to move all of all of this together. But these are on the horizons because it's largely where businesses are going to drive us. Yeah, and it's that abstraction of what we are so used to is traditional network and compute uh, that really requires that mind shift to, to happen. And look, Paul and I have been talking about this for a long time because it was something I saw coming, you know, over five years ago and realized that we had to shift. And we've seen some really interesting technologies evolve to get closer to this concept of getting yourself integrated into that and not relying on having a physical host to do a security control, but we're still a long way away from, from getting to that Nirvana state. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, about 10 years ago, we started on a journey uh, that we call Beyond Corp. And it came out of the realization that our traditional thinking about the network perimeter was wrong. Um, our workforce was no longer sitting in buildings. They were very mobile. Um, we, we have looked at uh, security activity data from all seven continents. I expect it to come from space at some point. Mm -hmm. um, the workforce is just incredibly mobile. And that, of course, reflects uh, what's happening with our users and our customers as well. And so we started breaking down our traditional notions of, of, of what trust means. You know, trust doesn't mean that you're sitting inside the building or that you're, that you're on a particular machine. It, it has to do with the, the data, where does the data need to be? Where is the user that's interacting with the data? And how do we build that trust without relying on these old models? Um, the analogy we typically use is castles. Um, you know, castles, everything inside the castle is secure. Um, but what happens when the castle is, is penetrated? Well, what if we just didn't have castle walls? What if we tried to protect the assets in a different way, regardless of where they were? And I think we're going to see that more and more with 
data security as a topic because of your point that you know the, these traditional notions are being broken down and we're going to have to evolve the models how we think about them Heather, how do we educate the management and C-level executives and the founders of the companies uh, about these changes? Because we've really talked about two different changes, right? The changes in the roles in networking and security and, and systems, and also the changes in the way that we look at security as not being the perimeter and really being about, you know, Matt's analogy, apps, users, and data, which I think is very fundamental to, to Google's uh, research on that topic. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really great question. And had we done this interview before COVID-19, I would have given you a very different answer. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a natural evolution in the success of business that's driving people to the cloud, that's driving people to think differently about IT and about how developers work. And that's a natural evolution that without any significant disruption would take a little bit of time. But COVID-19 is a really good example of why this is absolutely necessary for businesses. Overnight, they went from realizing their traditional models for things like working remotely no longer worked. Um, you know, I, I've, I've had probably three or four conversations a week since um, global lockdowns of people wanting to adopt a VPN-less state for their networks. And I think that, you know, that's, that's kind of a rough education I think the other part of that is, and we talk a lot about this in the book, is how to create the culture of security within an organization. And that's true whether it's a volunteer organization or a large enterprise. But culture ultimately has to start with the leadership. So we talk about some of these strategies that even the individual developer or the individual administrator or SRE can adopt to show the value of some of these innovative thinking. So small things like you wanna roll out a new security control, those are never very popular. How can you create an appetite for that? How can you show that change is going to be safe? How can you show that it has a value and that it's cost effective? And I think through these kind of small learning moments, you can actually convince you know, leadership who's willing to make a change. Um, and then, of course, with COVID-19, we, we have a major disruption that if you're in one of these roles now is a, is a major opportunity for you to step up and, and show that this can be beneficial. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, that transformation, I thought Gene Kim did a great job in the Unicorn Project showing that, that transformation and how they convince management that this is the way we do things now. And it's very different. Yeah. Yeah, and we have an external event like what we've been going through that I think now accelerates what I've been talking about for five years is that this was, this day was eventually going to happen. Uh, and it was slowly happening to your point, Heather, but now we have this external event that I think now really puts a spotlight on where this can really accelerate going forward. And that means as security professionals, it, it from our industry perspective, we've got to start thinking a little bit differently I look at the book and, and, you know, there's like 500 pages of, I, I bet, just compelling content. Where should, is there a place where people can look in, in here and say, this is what I should kind of read first to really understand what's going on? Is, is there a, a good place to start with, with this book? Absolutely. So we acknowledge up front that this is, you know, this is not a Sherlock Holmes novel. You're not going to sit down and read it in a weekend. It's really a book about challenging thinking. So what I recommend is that you start with a few places and then cherry pick, depending on where you're at and what problems you're seeing today, what changes you want to make, cherry pick what other parts of the book you want to read. And I would start with the introduction. There are two chapters in the introduction that give an overview of our approach we talk a little bit about adversaries. And then I would actually read the end of the book. And the end of the book begins with a case study from the Chrome security team, how they started their product security team, the versions of that team, some of the challenges they've solved, and how they've worked with engineers to get started. And then the culture sections. And this touches on, you know, how do you make change? How do you institute change? And then cherry pick the technical chapters in between on testing, on building resiliency, and come back to them from time to time as you are facing those challenges. I think that's the most reasonable approach to the book. 
you can try to read it end to end, but I guarantee it's it's not going to be the page turner that you might expect from mm -hmm. like a Sherlock Holmes or something. So perfect. That's exactly what I wanted our listeners to understand because it is it's a long book. So um, yeah. that's that's great it's, advice. Yeah, and we wanted it to be challenging. We wanted it to be advanced so that when you read it in five years, you're still thinking about new thoughts and 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 pushing your your uh, conversations forward. And uh, so it's it's um, we had some great reviewers, I should say, uh, from O'Reilly who really challenged us to think about the book um, and, and what we wanted it to be. That's awesome, uh, Matt. Any other questions uh, for Heather? No, I'm good. Like I said, I just needed a guide to get through the 500 pages. Now I have it. <laughs> and let me say, you know, if I just have a few minutes, that sure. uh, there are over 150 contributors to this book. Wow. And uh, six author editors. I We had an amazing team at O'Reilly. Um, anybody who's ever written a book probably knows this, but uh, you end up cutting out as much content as you leave in. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope that it's, it's helpful for people long term. Um, Again, spend some time with it, come back to it from time to time, and reach out. Um, all the authors are named, and a lot of us are on Twitter. So reach out if you ever have questions or want to chat through some of the content. Fantastic. The book is Building Secure and Reliable Systems uh, from O'Reilly Press. Uh, make sure you go check it out. It sounds awesome. It's on my reading list now for sure, Heather. <laughs> thank you. Heather, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Great. Thanks, all. With that, that will conclude the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.